Hi everyone, welcome to Medicine for Dummies. I'm Dr. V. In my channel, I talk about all kinds of interesting topics for medical and nursing students. Most of these videos will be things that will be asked in your exams as multiple choice questions, structured essay questions, case discussions, and viva. So hit a like, subscribe, and share, and stick around for more as we talk about a new topic every week. So today we start on the second topic of the series on pediatric case discussions. I will be giving you an overview of how to take history from these patients, what points you should focus on in the examination, the investigations you should do, and the theory for the discussion on VIVA. If you have any requests on other topics you would like me to do, just comment below and let me know. So let's get started. Today, our topic is acquired heart diseases. There are three important acquired heart diseases we talk about in children, which are rheumatic fever, infective endocarditis, and Kawasaki disease. In this video, we will be learning all about rheumatic fever. Let's start with a case history. A 10-year-old girl presented with migratory type large joint arthritis and fever. On CVS examination, she was found to have a murmur. She is from the estate sector and has seven other siblings. The first thing with any case is to take a thorough history. We learned how to take a very detailed history in our previous video, so I won't be going into a lot of detail here. A video on how to take a thorough history in pediatrics will be coming up soon, so you can have a draft which you can use for any type of history taking in pediatrics. To recognize the condition, we have to know the signs and symptoms of rheumatic fever. There are some classic features of rheumatic fever which you can always see, but one of the main ones is fever. Also, you can see a migratory type polyarthritis. This means that there is inflammation of multiple joints. It starts in one large joint like the ankle and then resolves completely in a few days. And then another large joint like the knee gets affected, hence the name migratory. The third thing you can get is a murmur. So the pathophysiology of carditis in rheumatic fever is really important. What happens is that our body produces antibodies against the antigens on the bacteria. Some of the antigens in the bacteria are similar to antigens found in our body itself. This is called molecular mimicry. So the antibodies that are produced can sometimes attack the harmless antigens in our bodies, which are similar to bacterial antigens, thus producing inflammation in areas like the joints or heart valves. So that is the pathophysiology behind carditis in rheumatic fever. It is therefore important to note that the damage done is not from a direct effect from the bacteria itself. The next sign you could see is a rash called erythema marginatum, which is fairly unique for rheumatic carditis and looks like this. And subcutaneous nodules like this. The next one is chorea, which are dance-like movements of the limbs. This is actually a late presentation and you get it around two to six months after the acute episode. Your history won't be complete without asking the risk factors and complications of the disease. The main risk factors we have identified is poor socioeconomic status and overcrowding. This is the reason why now rheumatic fever is mainly seen in developing countries with poor living conditions. The complications are many as, as you can see here. As I said before, rheumatic carditis gives rise to murmurs, especially mitral stenosis and infrequently mitral regurgitation and aortic regurgitation. The risk of thrombosis also increases and the risk of infective endocarditis will also increase as we will learn later because the probability of getting infective endocarditis is increased when there are damaged heart valves. Due to various valvular defects, you can also get either left, right, or congestive cardiac failure. 
So in left heart failure, there is pulmonary congestion, meaning blood stagnates in the vessels of the lungs, which leads to pulmonary hypertension or increased back pressure into the pulmonary artery. This can cause tricuspid regurgitation. The same mechanism can cause pulmonary hemorrhages because of the increased pressure in the veins in the lungs. So likewise, we complete the history with the rest of the components and then look for features of rheumatic fever in the examination. You can see here the typical rash you get, erythema marginatum and subcutaneous nodules. Erythema marginatum is a non-painful, non-pruritic rash with a pink center and a raised red margin. Now, moving on to the microbiological aspect of it, the disease is caused by group A beta hemolytic streptococci. They are specially found in pharyngeal infection and more rarely with skin sepsis and that leads to the development of antibodies as I previously mentioned. The investigations you can do are to get a throat swab for culture to identify group A beta hemolytic streptococci and do anti-streptolysin O teeters. So streptolysin O is an antigen produced by the bacteria and anti-streptolysin O are the antibodies produced against it. So we can measure the level or amount of the antibodies in our bodies. Other non-specific investigations you can do are anti-DNA B levels, rapid antigen testing for strep, and ESR and CRP, which will be elevated. But since there are no diagnostic investigations for rheumatic fever, we use a set of criteria known as the revised Jones criteria to diagnose the condition. The newest guidelines are a bit complex and I will be briefly mentioning them, but if you are having a hard time remembering them, this version is also fine for the moment. So the revised Jones criteria are of two types. Major criteria, which are the typical and somewhat specific things you might see in children with rheumatic fever, and minor criteria, which are non-specific, although assisting in diagnosis. As you can see, the major criteria are the five signs and symptoms we learned before, and the minor criteria are fever, joint pain, the elevated ESR and CRP, which are inflammatory markers, which we talked about, and ECG changes, uh, where you can see a prolonged PR interval. So for diagnosis, you have to either have two major criteria or one major criteria plus two minor criteria with evidence of strep infection. So these clinical features have to be present with either a positive throat culture, rising ASOT levels, or positive rapid antigen tests. The newest criteria denote between high-risk populations and low-risk populations, and the minor criteria differ according to the population. Low-risk populations are those with a low incidence and prevalence of acute rheumatic fever, and you have to have more evidence to confirm rheumatic fever in this population. If you are interested and thorough with the criteria described so far, you can check out the more detailed revised version. So the management is mainly supportive with strict bed rest and monitoring. We give penicillin as prophylaxis for further episodes and to prevent spread to other people. It is important to note that antibiotics have no place in treatment of rheumatic fever because as I mentioned before, this is merely an antibody mediated condition and the damage is not directly by the bacteria. You can give oral penicillin for 10 days in the acute setting or a single dose of IM benzathine penicillin. The mainstay of treatment is control of inflammation with corticosteroids in severe disease and using antiplatelet therapy in arthritis and carditis. Other supportive therapy can be used in complications such as diuretics in heart failure, pericardiocentesis in pericardial effusions, and surgery if there are valvular abnormalities with uncontrolled symptoms. The most important part of treating rheumatic fever is actually prevention. 
This is to prevent recurrent infection and thus preventing repeated damage to the valves and other organs and to prevent these harmful strains of bacteria from infecting other people because pharyngeal infection is common and you can easily spread the disease. So the methods of prevention is by maintaining good oral hygiene and improving living conditions and giving antibiotic prophylaxis. The regimes you give differ from country to country and the table given here depicts one regime you can use according to how much rheumatic fever has affected your heart. So that is everything you need to know about rheumatic fever. We will be talking about infective endocarditis in the next video. Thanks for watching!